thank you, Tony, for getting us kicked off here this evening. I'd like to thank all of you for being here at this inaugural service of the American Christian Patriot Church. We are very grateful. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. Well, we'd like to welcome all of you, but we have some very special guests who've traveled quite a ways to come here, and I certainly want to acknowledge them. We have, ladies first, Cynthia Martinez. Cynthia Martinez is an absolutely amazing woman of faith and patriotism. I've known her for a number of years, and she is just a dynamo, a ball of fire, always working for God and country. And among the things that she has done, she is the founder and the president of Words of Comfort, Hope, and Promise. Now, you'll see the website information on the screen as you're watching this. And if you don't get it, please check our website, acpcusa.org, and you'll see Friends of the ACPC, Friends of the American Christian Patriot Church, and you'll be able to get her information there. Words of Comfort, Hope, and Promise is a, a magnificent military-oriented ministry that serves the interests of our service men and women, both here in country and overseas. Among other things, they send care packages many, many times during the year to thousands of different troops. And it shows that we care. They get comfort items that will bolster their spirits and, and uh, let them know that people back here are thinking about them. <coughs> and that we care about what they're doing. But also here at home as well. She does a lot for the troops who are here because as you probably know, a lot of them are living at a bare subsistence level. And do, she does a lot for the families of those who have been, those families that have been left behind when their, their family members are on deployment. She has several parties, uh, especially around the holidays, Christmas time, uh, provides food and clothing and toys for the family members. Thousands of toys were distributed. She is the winner of the Bob Hope Award a few years ago, uh, and just absolutely magnificent. So Cynthia, thank you so much for being here. Let's have a round of applause here. Next, Dr. Wiley Drake. Dr. Drake is another amazing man of faith and patriotism. I've known him for a number of years as well. He also is just a dynamo. Uh, he is always on the God and go and always for God and for country. Uh, he's just uh, such an inspiration to us. He is the pastor of the First Southern Baptist Church in Buena Park. But among his many other duties and responsibilities, he is also a founder and director of the Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C. Now he travels back, what, you probably on, an, on average at least once a month to, Was to Washington, D.C., talking to our representatives, trying to keep them on the straight and narrow, and you can imagine how a difficult task that is. But he's in it all the time, doing a magnificent job. He hosts two radio, internet, radio, and television programs a day. And he's just very, very busy in spreading the word. He was even doing some, gathering some information just a few minutes before we kicked off today. So he is, again, a great man of faith as well. And another individual I've known for a number of years who has been a great servant of God and our country in the way he has taught some of the founding principles of this country in the classes he has given on the Constitution. And that's Steve Jackson. He's also come up here from quite a distance. So let's hear it for Dr. Drake and for Steve. Very, very diligent in their service to God and country. So I would really like to thank them all for being here and all of you for being here. I know for many of you, you've come quite a distance and we appreciate you sharing in this event. Well, if you are here or if you are listening and watching on your computers, there's a very good chance you're doing so because you heard about us from some of our inform information, some of the advertisements that we've gotten out. And one of the things that we, one of the points that we made is that this is a very different kind of church. We said, this ain't your grandma's Christian church. And so we're going to talk about that. Some of you may be wondering, well, how is it so different? And why do we need another Christian church when the other churches out there are doing such a good job of letting America slip into the moral abyss? <laughs> oh, maybe I let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, in my presentation tonight, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about us. What we're about, why we're here, what it is we will accomplish. 
And as I do that, I'd like to begin by drawing a distinction between view and vision. Now a view is what you see. A vision can be what you hope to see. So let's start off and ask all of you out there across the country, what do you see? What do you see when you open the newspaper or turn on a news channel or even just watch entertainment, so-called entertainment on TV? What do you see? What do you see when you drive down the street on the way to work or school or shopping or some entertainment venue? What do you see? You see lots of things. You'll see other people. You'll see children at play. You'll see trees in the sky and buildings. But in the, these are in the midst of a much bigger picture. And that much bigger picture is an America that is in trouble. Amen. An America that is failing and falling. Amen. Now, this is part of the view that we all are looking at. Let me detail some aspects of that view. Let's start in the international community. Internationally, the United States is surrounded by a world that is trying to knock it down a peg or two. They see us as an enemy. They are jealous of our success. And sometimes they've outright defined us as an enemy to be destroyed. Amen. We have a resurgent Russia and China. And both of them see us as an enemy and are trying to supplant our position as a global leader. In addition to that, we have an outright lunatic in charge of North Korea who is busy developing a nuclear weapons program and the missiles to deliver them to us. And then beyond that, we have more lunacy in Iran. Another Islamic jihadist nation that is developing nuclear weapons and the long-range missiles to deliver them. Now, I know I know what some of the people in the administration and elsewhere have been saying. No, no, they're not really doing that. And even if they were, we've taken measures to keep that from happening. Even people in the administration admit that all they have done is maybe put off, delay the development of these nuclear weapons by several months. And even if you were inclined to think that Iran is not really trying to develop a, a nuclear weapons program, well, why are they trying to develop long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles? Let me clue you in about something, brothers and sisters. You don't need an ICBM to deliver a hand grenade. You do need one to deliver a much larger payload. And even if, even if these things were true, that they were not developing and never have any intention of developing a nuclear weapon, which just doesn't make sense if you understand Islam, which defines all non-Muslims as enemies. And even if you accept that they are not going to develop long-range missiles, the fact is that we've just made arrangements for them to receive between 100 and 150 billion dollars in extra revenue. Now what do you think a jihadist nation is going to do with that? This nation daily chants death to America, death to Israel. What do you think they're going to do with all that money? We are not safe. We're not safe. Well, let's bring it in a little bit farther now. Let's bring it into our borders. Oh, wait a minute. I've just <laughs> revealed how old I am. I'm thinking about the days when we did still have borders. <laughs> We haven't really had borders for a long time, have we? You see, a lot of corrupt politicians have found ways to make hay, so to speak, by catering to certain elements in our own population whom they think can be bought off with this promise of bringing their friends and family over. They are not your friends. You see, in this nation, we have minorities who oftentimes are stuck in low-end and dead-end jobs. And anyone who invites another 11, 12, or more million into this country to compete for those jobs are not your friend. And furthermore, these people who are coming in here illegally are consuming tens of billions of dollars of resources that could be spent on our own minorities to help them out. Right? right? Now, I'm not against these people coming here. Just do it legally. Right. Follow the rules. Amen. Doesn't God say as much? He says, look here, here's some rules. I'd like you to follow them. Things work out a whole lot better when you do than when you don't. Okay? So, 
our border problem is even greater than that. Because in allowing this porous border, we've also allowed not only a number of illegals to come in here, but we've allowed other types of illegals as well, like members of the drug cartels, like international terrorists. Again, you're not safe. Well, let's look at the political situation. Now we come inside our borders, and let's look at the political situation. The government is corrupt. The political system is dysfunctional. Both political parties have not only failed us, they betrayed us. Right. And that may be tough for some of you to, to take, because I know I probably just stepped on one of your favorite parties. But you know what it says in here. The truth will set you free. Amen. So let's look at the truth. The truth is the Republican and Democratic parties are the political tag team for more than 150 years that has run this nation. And they've run it into the ground. And they're offering nothing new to fix what they've broken. Oh, they keep repackaging it. They keep putting a different bow on it. But when it gets right down to it, when you really take the bow off and look closely and smell closely, it's the same old stuff. And it's, it's rotten. We need something different. Amen. The system itself is corrupt. <laughs> and I hate to say it, but you know, it's not going to matter that much whoever we put behind the resolute desk in the Oval Office. Because whoever that person is, even if he or she could walk on water, he or she is still going to be confined within a system that is corrupt and that is broken. There's only so much they can do, and pretty much all they can do is slow down the progress toward the cliff. So our political system has big troubles. And gee, so does our economic system. Anybody who has studied economics, anybody who's familiar with fiscal and monetary policy can rattle off a whole list of tsunamis getting ready to crash in on us that would make the Great Recession of 2007, 2008 look like a picnic. And a lot of those foreign nations that we talked about who don't like us very well, they're already in cahoots to make this happen. You look at the very foundation of this nation, economically, and you see all of the pillars being eroded away. The middle class, which is the basis, the rock, the foundation of a free enterprise society, is shrinking and shrinking. Average family income is getting less and less. This is devastating. And I haven't even mentioned close to $19 trillion in debt and going up. And to kind of support something I said before, yes, Barack Obama is the biggest spender in American history. The second biggest spender was his predecessor, George W. Bush. Tweedledee, tweedledum. But even as bad as these things are, this isn't the worst. This is not the worst of it. You see, there is another grave problem that threatens far more than any of these things combined. <coughs> it's insidious. It isn't so obvious, and so it doesn't get a lot of attention. And quite frankly, it's no longer politically correct to even talk about these things. But it's true all the same. You see, it's kind of like a cancer. Cancer starts off very small. A single cell goes wrong, but then it divides, and now there's two of them. And then they divide, and then there's four, and then there's eight, and then there's 16. And pretty soon you start feeling a little bit off, and you just think it's a flu, a cold, I'm getting older, something like that. And you don't check it out until it's too late. But we have a cancer that is eating away at this nation, at its soul, eroding its foundation, destroying and rotting the fabric of America. And that is moral decay. You see, if you go back and you think about everything that epitomizes the United States, everything that has made it great, everything that the founders worked toward, everything that makes us unique and wonderful is all predicated upon having a moral society. If you don't have that, you can't have the other things. You simply cannot. It is impossible. Think about what America is all about. It's about freedom. It's about liberty. It's about <coughs> rights. It's about living your life the way you want to and being free to do that as long as you're not denying someone else the chance to do the same thing. But you cannot do that if you do not have a moral society. 
Why? Well, let me give you a quick example here. What do you think would happen if we gave a great deal of individual liberty, and that's really at the core of American uniqueness and greatness, individual liberty. What do you think would happen if we gave a great deal of individual liberty to an immoral people? And all God's children said, duh. <laughs> They'll do immoral stuff. Now remember, immorality by its very nature, think about it, everything we call a crime, immoral, or a sin, is something that hurts someone else without some overriding justification. So, an immoral society by definition is one that's basically gone wild, where people can go out and prey on one another. Do you really want to live in a place like that? This lack of morals creates a penitentiary society, a nation populated by criminals but without the benefit of the bars and guards to restrain them. I guarantee you, you don't want to live there, do you? And yet, this is what has happened to our country. That's our view. Now, whenever we see serious problems, two questions automatically come to mind. <clears throat> One, well, who's responsible? And two, what can we do about it? Well, who's responsible? Probably you're jumping to the conclusion that, well, those dadgum politicians are responsible for it. They're the ones who made that mess. You just said that a little while ago. You said they're the political tag team, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they've done a lot of it, but you know what? That's what politicians do. That's been true for thousands of years. We should expect that. That's why the founders gave us the government that they did so that the politicians would not have the power to do that kind of stuff to us. Sure, the politicians do that. Of course they do. But somebody's supposed to be watching them. Somebody's supposed to be the guard dog. Somebody's supposed to be the watcher on the wall. Somebody's supposed to be the sheep dog of the good shepherd. Who is that someone? The leaders of the Christian church. The pastors and the other leaders. Now, not all of them. I guarantee you, if we had more pastors like Dr. Drake in the pulpit, we would have no need for the American Christian Patriot Church. This country would be squared away, it'd be squeaky clean, and it'd be heading in the right direction. But unfortunately, he is a rarity. God bless him that we have him, but he is a rarity. Now, some of you might be thinking, I don't know, Hebron, you're getting a little harsh there. I mean, it's my pastor. I love my pastor. Guy, good gal, whatever. Yeah, well, it's not just my view. There have been a few times in American history when we have witnessed a spiritual awakening, a revival. And one of the big ones was called the Great, the Second Great Awakening. And it was kind of in the early, mid 1800s. And there was a fellow named Charles Finney, who was one of the champions of this Great Awakening. Let me read to you what he said about a 150 or so years ago and see if it doesn't apply today. He said, if there is decay of conscience, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the public press lacks moral discernment, sound familiar? The pulpit is responsible for it. If the church is degenerate and worldly, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the world loses its interest in Christianity, the pulpit is responsible for it. If Satan rules in our halls of legislation, the pulpit is responsible for it. If our politics become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government are ready to fall away. The pulpit is responsible for it. And by pulpit, of course, you know he didn't mean this thing. He means who stands behind it. Now some of you may still be thinking, well that's a little harsh. I love that guy up there who's talking to me every day or every Sunday. Well, let me get a little more pointed. Let's look at a few issues. 43 
years and four days ago, the United States Supreme Court, one of the greatest mischief makers of our time, <laughs> issued an order in a judgment that they made called Roe v. Wade. Since that time in the intervening 43 years, approximately 60 million, that's six zero million, of our most innocent and helpless brothers and sisters have been brutally slaughtered in their mother's womb at abortion facilities around the country and for no better reason that their existence was inconvenient. <coughs> this is monstrous. Amen. Monstrous. And if you think that term is a little strong, well, let's put it in perspective. Adolf Hitler killed about 10 million people in his concentration camps, and we call him a monster, right? Joseph Stalin doubled down on Hitler. He killed about 20 to 30 million in his gulag, his prison system, and in his purges. We call him a monster, and rightly so. And Mao Zedong made them all look like pikers. He killed upwards of 50 million in his various purges and the likes. And we call him a monster, and rightly so. Our secular, progressive humanists are responsible for the death of about 60 million. You're going to tell me the word monstrous doesn't apply? And let me put this in perspective in another way. Historians tell us that in all the wars America has fought, from the American Revolution to the present, we have lost about one million dead. That number varies a little bit because our records weren't all that accurate in the first hundred years or so. But some say a little bit less, some say a little bit more. But right about a hundred, or rather one million have died. That means that our secular progressive humanists are responsible for 60 times as many dead Americans as all the monarchs and tyrants and terrorists we have faced combined. So let me ask you, what have you, your church, and your pastor done about that? Well, as I said, the uh, Supreme Court has been quite an author of mischief over the years. And fairly recently, just a few months ago, they stepped in once again. And they said that homosexual marriage was okay. Now, God said that sex, uh, homosexual behavior is abhorrent. It is detestable. But apparently the members of the Supreme Court felt that they were wiser than God, and so they overruled him. And they said that something which God called an abomination, they called the law of the land. So what have you, your church, and your pastor done about that? Well, the spurious notion of separation of church and state has been used for decades now with devastating effects. In the first place, it is a lie. And if you doubt that, well, I'll, I'll give you an opportunity here. If you can find the word separation of church and state or anything even close to that in the Constitution, in the Bill of Rights, in any of the other amendments, or in the Declaration of Independence, I will eat the bug of your choice. And there's some pretty nasty looking bugs out there. That ought to motivate you. Good luck. It is a lie. But it has been used deftly by the enemies of this country and our God to bring about devastating effects. God has been exiled from government. He has been expelled from our schools. His influence has been minimized throughout the rest of society. Again, with absolutely devastating consequences. So, let me ask you this. What have you your church and your pastor done about that? Well, as we look around, as we said, violent crime is on the rise. Immorality is increasing. Islam is on the march. And the influence of Christianity in the Christian church in America is on the decline. So, what have you, your church, and your pastor done about that? 
And if the best answer you can come up with is, well, there isn't much we can do except pray, then I suggest you need another church because yours isn't getting the job done. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe in prayer. I spend a lot of time praying every day, starting in the morning and going right through, through right before I turn in. I believe in prayer. But I think people have it wrong a lot of times. You see, prayer is a great start. It's a horrible finish. Prayer isn't something that you're just supposed to say, fold your hands, say a few words, and say, yippee skippy, God's got this, and now I can go sit down in front of the television and eat some chips and drink some soda. God is looking for partners, not parasites. Prayer is supposed to be a prelude to effective action, not an excuse for inaction. So when you say your prayer, then you need to become the prayer. You need to put on your work gloves, put on your combat boots, jump in the middle of the blood and the mud, go to work, and then God will say, okay, you've convinced me you're serious. Here I come, look out. Amen. So yes, prayer is important. But for a lot of people, they just offer up a prayer, and then they turn around and they go traipsing off. Not enough. And our religious leaders, I'm afraid, by and large, have failed our God and our country. A lot of them say they don't want to get involved with politics. It's dirty. It's messy. I'm sure glad Jesus didn't feel that way. Or we, otherwise, we'd all be going to hell. He jumped in the middle of the mud and the blood and everything else. He was spat upon. He was beaten. He was whipped. He was cursed. He was crucified. He did it for us. So what are we going to do for him? How about giving him back his country? Yes. That's what we're talking about in the American Christian Patriot Church. Let's give it back to America. And that leads me now to vision. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. If all we can offer the members of our congregation, the members of this nation is, well, let's do more of the same that we've been doing and hope somehow it's going to work out differently. That's no vision. That's delusion. We need something else. What is our vision? The vision of the American Christian Patriot Church is to rebuild the United States of America spiritually, politically, and economically according to biblical principles and the ideals of the founders. That's our vision, and it is so integral to our very nature that it is also our mission statement. Okay? Great idea. But ideas need to be turned into action. Remember what James said about be doers of the word, Amen. not just hearers. Well, the American Christian Patriot Church is a church of doers, a church of workers, a church of warriors. Let me tell you, we have a bold, amazing plan. And if I may borrow from Scripture again, which is the best way, place to borrow, it will make your ears tingle when you hear it. This plan is so bold and so powerful that we will be able to begin ending abortion in certain parts of our country in a matter of months not years or decades. This plan is so bold and powerful that it will give us the ability to start tearing up same-sex marriage certificates and stop the issuance of new ones in a matter of months, not years or decades. This plan is so powerful that we will explode the notion of separation of church and state. This plan is so powerful that we will be able to stop Islam dead in its tracks. This plan is so powerful that it will make all of us freer, richer, safer, safer, and happier. This plan is so powerful that it will enable us to fight and win the second American Revolution in less time than it took to win the first without taking over the White House, the Congress, the Supreme Court, or any constitutional 
amendments. This plan is so powerful that we will put God back in government and return him to the throne of America where he belongs. And not only can it do all this, I guarantee you it can. Now, not too many people know me so well that one of the words I use there would really give them a little zinger. I almost never use the word promise or guarantee. Not because I'm not committed, but because I'm just not in charge of most things. I'm not going to promise you the sun will rise tomorrow because I'm not in charge of the sun. Someone else is. But I can guarantee this plan will work. How? Why? Because it already has. You see, we did it once before. And it worked. You see, every time a nation has entrusted itself to the one true God, and has been willing to follow his advice. Not advice, his commands. They have won. Every time. Amen. Think of the Israelites and America. Every time it will not fail. Because we are trusting in the one who cannot fail. Right? Right. Think about this. At the beginning of our nation, we basically consecrated this country to God. Now, I'd like to urge you to get a copy of George Washington's first inaugural address and read that. I'm not going to take a whole lot of time on that now. I don't want to drag on and on and on. But let me paraphrase two important parts of that address. For one thing, he said, you know, it's basically impossible to think that we have come this far as a nation and done the things we have done without the help of God. Amen. And the second thing he said was, the propitious smiles of heaven, in other words, God's favor, can never be expected on a land that does not continue to follow his rules of right and order. Amen. When we followed him, we won. And we started with virtually nothing, and we exploded into the world's and history's greatest, most powerful, most prosperous, and noblest nation. It was incredible. In fact, there was a fellow named Alexis de Tocqueville, a Frenchman who came over here, I think it was 1831, because he said, man, there's something wild going on there across the Atlantic. I got to find out more about this. And so he came over with a friend and he studied for quite a while. And he wrote a two volume set that's been entitled Democracy in America. Now, one of the remarks, it's not in those, either of those two books, but a remark that has been attributed to Alexis de Tocqueville is this, and it is so wise and penetrating, and it gets right down to it. He said, America is great because she is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. In the beginning, we were good. George Washington consecrated this nation to God. He dedicated it to God. We did it God's way. <laughs> and the rest, as they say, is history. But then, we started to fall away. We were told there was a better way. It wasn't better. And we have seen that our Greatness and our goodness have moved in lockstep with one another. When we were good, we became great. But now we're not so good. And what's happened to our greatness? It's collapsing. Right. We have done this to ourselves. And those people who should have been the watchdogs, the ones who should have been warning their congregations about this, are the ones who are most responsible. Our shame in turning away from God is unfathomable and inexcusable and unforgivable yes. except to a God who is characterized by infinite mercy. Because God has said, even with as bad as you have been, mm -hmm. I'll help you. I will restore you if, 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 if what? If my people who are called by my name 
will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. You want to have your sin forgiven? You want to see the land healed? You know exactly how to do it. And that's exactly what we're committed to. The American Christian Patriot Church is committed to do exactly that. We need to put God first. We need to do it His way. And we need to be unabashed and unashamed about that. And if you want to make a difference, if you want to be a difference, join us. We're going to fight our way to the top, and it's going to be a fight. But we are going to fight, and we are going to win. Not because we are great, but because the one who stands with us Amen. is great and cannot be defeated. Amen. Well, I'd like to wrap up my portion here. And I'd like to quote somebody that isn't normally associated with being a, a great Christian. But he really said something powerful, and I think it's something that we need to acknowledge and build upon. It was about 110 years ago. His name was Samuel Clements, better known as Mark Twain. He said this in an interview back in 1905. It will be conceded that a Christian's first duty is to God. It then follows as a matter of course that it is his duty to carry his Christian code of morals to the polls and vote them. If Christians should vote their duty to God at the polls, they would carry every election and do it with ease. If the Christians of America could be persuaded to vote God and a clean ticket, it would bring about a moral revolution that would be incalculably beneficent. It would save the country. Those words are even truer today. Yeah. Even though the Christian community has been shrinking, even though the influence of Christianity in America has been shrinking, we can reverse that. Right. Not only can we reverse, but we still have enough power. If we join together, even a fair number of us join together, we win. Amen. It's just that simple. Amen. We win. Amen. The problem is, much of our army is asleep and many of its leaders are in the officers club goofing off. We need to get the leaders leading again. Yes. And if they're not going to do it, if they're not going to follow the example of Dr. Drake here in his courageous fight, well, we'll follow his example. And that's why we have the American Christian Patriot Church. This ain't your grandma's Christian church. <laughs> We're fighters. We're warriors. We're in it to win it, and we will settle for absolutely nothing less. Why? Because you and our God deserve it.